Yeah, no. Pardon? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I was just going for broke. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I thought it was at 6.35? No. Where is? 8.35. Hey, Sarah. When you say the version on the hymnal, do you mean the lyrics or, or the, 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 like the, I am weak, yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. What's it, that's a good catch. 
one, three. Through this world of toils and snares. Should I do it again? So we gotta be careful. It's like through this world of toils and stairs, if I'm not mistaken. Because I think it's uh, sweet yes or something. So we'll do verses one and two. When my, when my feet will have toes, do they know that they can? Yes. yes. When my feet will have toes, they can. Can we just keep this one here? <laughs> then we have that offense. Sorry to feel for I know. That was beautiful, though. It's serious. I loved every moment of that. Sure. I'll sit next to you. I'm just saying, I don't. (laughs) 
So. Hey, Alex. Can you mute the computer? to God's presence singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come into God's presence singing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Great job, Marla. Uh -oh. Thank you.
Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Woods Church. It is so good to see all of you. This is a very exciting day for lots of reasons. Uh, first, I want to say to those of you who are joining us online this morning, if you would please mute yourselves. Um, <laughs> That doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> um, so that we don't have any interference here, but I'm so glad that you were able to get on our Zoom link and that you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, I will remind you please to find the fellowship registry at the end of each row, sign in so that we can know that you um, have been with us and uh, be able to rejoice in the fact that you're part of this cloud of witnesses. This morning, the big excitement is that we have our candidate preaching to call this morning. Uh, the Reverend J.C. Austin is with us. Welcome. Immediately following the service, we will go into our congregational meeting. Um, if you are a member here at Woods and present, do not leave. Um, we have a lot, we have business to conduct and um, we're, we're hoping that you'll be able to stay through our congregational meeting. Um, I also want to remind you, in case you needed it, that today is Father's Day. And so we are grateful for fathers and all of those uh, who have been as fathers to us. So um, remember that today in your celebration. As you know, our theme for this year is joyful noises. And we have our first joyful noise to be played this morning. Can we see that? <laughs> That is our joyful noise for the day. <laughs> if you have your own joyful noises, please email those to me or to the, the church and uh, we will see to it that it gets up there. Um, they have been uh, really, really fun to watch as they've come in. And now, I know you're not gonna believe it, but I'm remembering, let's pass the peace with one of their... <laughs> just making sure they're not doing something else. All right, good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. It is time to worship. 
So we thank God for providing in ways more than we can ask or imagine. It is time to worship. So we praise God for the privilege of gathering with the song in our hearts. It is time to worship. So we seek to honor God through our responses and our gifts today. Let us worship God. Thank you. At this time, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. I just wanted to say that the three songs that we will sing as praise songs this morning are songs that we will do, be doing this week on Wood's work. So in singing these songs with us this morning, you are, we are taking you with us on Wood's work. So please rise as we sing. It is a privilege to be able to come before God in time of confession. God, of course, already knows what is in our hearts even before we speak the words. So let's join together now in our prayer of confession found in the bulletin. Holy God, we ask for your help, your power, your spirit, so that we can amend our lives and grow more each day into the image of Christ. We confess that we fear what is different. We confess that it's easier to lock the doors of our community than to receive those who don't look like we look, love like we love, or vote the way we vote. We confess that we have not loved out our call to share an abundant life and unconditional love. We believe that you have to ask to turn us around to a more inclusive way of living. So we ask you to do that. We ask you to give us the courage to change. 
We ask that you give us the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to be your people in all we say and do. Amen. To God's presence singing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come into God's presence singing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Friends, there is good news in the gospel. Indeed, God loves and cares for and calls each one of us. Let us rejoice and be glad in that call to inclusion and diversity and to be aware that God already knows what we need to have God hear. Not only are we known and loved, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We now come to a very special time in our worship service, um, the ordination and installation of deacons and elders at Woods Church, our officers. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. So I would invite the elders and deacons forward to be installed and ordained. Uh, as I call your name, come forward. Kurt Ivey, Nick Laughlin, Don Van Hassant, Zach Hogard. They are being ordained to the office of elder. And Kyle Vault, Jim Hutcher, Krista Hemmings, Catherine Kuhn, Kay Mitchell, Marilyn Pollock, Sarah Stein, and Norma Villanova to the office of deacon. And then those who have been formally ordained as elders, Linda Egbeer, Pat Johnson, Ed Lambert, Tom Lorario, Ellen Oakes, Suzanne Elliott Smith and the deacons, Donna Kramer Barnes, Linda Cramblett, Margaret Dugan, Rhonda Grubel, Penny Moore, and Kelly Nowatnik. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and stand this way. Y'all turn around and look at them so they can see you. They don't need to see us. <laughs> I'm going to get right behind you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right. I have a few questions to the candidate. Do you answer? Uh, I do. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church Universal and God's Word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith 
as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scriptures lead us to believe and do. Do you? I do. Will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world. Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And for the elders, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? And will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? And then to you all, I am going to ask these questions to the congregation. I want you to watch them as they answer. <laughs> They are making promises to help you keep your promises. So here we are. <laughs> Do we, the members of the church, accept Linda Eggbeer and Kurt Ivey and Pat Johnson and Ed Lambert, Tom Lerario, Nick Laughlin, Ellen Oaks, Susan Elliott Smith, Don Van Hassant, Zach Hogard, Donna Kramer Barnes, Linda Cramblett, Kyle DeVault, Margaret Dugan, Rhonda Grubel, Jim Hatcher, Krista Hemmings, Catherine Kuhn, Kay Mitchell, Penny Moore, Kelly Nowotnik, Marilyn Pollock, Sarah Stein, and Norma Villanova as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Please answer, we do. We do. And do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, answer, we do. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, eternal God, and give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you appointed prophets and priests and rulers. You have called pastors and teachers, bishops, deacons, and elders to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. And in the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of the church of Jesus Christ. For your servants in every age, O oh God, and for the church of Christ, we give you thanks and praise. And for elders, we pray that you, O oh Lord, will pour out your Holy Spirit on them, nourish them in the life of the Spirit, that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this, in this session and in every court of the church, that they may be servant leaders following Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence. 
And for our deacons, O oh God of grace, we ask that they may be faithful deacons, give them openness to the leading of the Spirit, train them in prayer that they may express the compassion of Christ for all. And we ask that in everything you give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become servant of your reign. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. And for all of Woods Church, for this community of faith, through the baptism waters, you claimed us all as your own and called us to share in Christ's ministry. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us that we may discern the gifts that you have given, calling them forth from one another and using those gifts together for the good of all in obedience to Christ and in the unity of his spirit. May we proclaim good news, make disciples, be light and leaven and share our bread, offer a cup of cold water, wash one another's feet and make us strong in Christ to live as your people and to show forth your saving love in the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, and you all are needing to be grateful to us because we didn't make you kneel um, at this point. <laughs> we declare that you are now elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ. And for this congregation, be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Lord. And so on behalf of this whole church, ministers and elders surround and greet you and love you in the days ahead and welcome. And you are now ordained and installed and blessed. Thanks be to God. They, they, they couldn't. here how are you I'm okay but you didn't meow meow thank you <laughs> thank you those are my people those are my people um, I'm gonna bring down the class of elders for 2044 yep these are elders for 2044 okay so uh, we're almost ready folks thank you Somewhere I have a smaller stool that I'm not afraid to fall off of. How are you guys? I can't do it. The last time they preached on the, on the lessons that's coming up, I, I parkoured down the sanctuary steps. I'm not even. Not even. Hey, who knows what today is? What? Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. That's right. You're... It's okay. Your dad what? <gasps> you have a Father's Day present for your dad? That's amazing. Yeah. You know what? Not everybody's dad's here. Oh my gosh. It's your parents' 10th anniversary? We'll give them a pass. Yeah. Yeah, my dad's not here either, so I wore his cross. This is a cross he got when he was ordained. Yes. Nice. So is that all that's happening today? Nothing in your world? There's a lot going on. What's happening in your world? In my world, our woods work team's being commissioned today, which is really exciting. Your dad's here? That's awesome. Are there some dads going to woods work? I'm sure there are, yeah. Yeah? Well... Who's going to Woodsworth? Are, are you going to Woodsworth? No. Are, are you going? Well, I know you are. You're out of uniform, though. Are, are y'all going? Who's going to Woodsworth? Oh, stand up if you're going to Woodsworth. Yay! Yay! Absolutely. If you haven't met Lee, he's the mayor of Sunday school. 
He is. I got to tell you, they fit so well with our story we're going to have downstairs. Our story is about a man from Ethiopia, and he was a very important person, and he had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way back, he was taking a new look at some of the stories, some of the scriptures in the Old Testament, and uh, he was a little confused, and I am very proud of him. He pulled over to the side uh, to continue looking at that scripture, and there was this guy. His name was Philip, and God had said, go south, and help somebody understand this. And so he's going by and he knocks. He goes, what you doing? And the man, man said, do you understand this? And you know, Philip helped him. And then he was baptized. And then he went on and helped other people understand. That's kind of what's happening today. We had elders and deacons. And you know what? We, they were called together. And they, they said, hey, we're going to help people understand what we should do and how we should care. And we said, cool. And we all prayed and said, yay. Then there's another group who has God has called to go south and help people understand something. And they don't even have to use words. They're going to build a house. Nope. They're going to build two houses. And through that, they're going to tell those people that the people in Missouri, oh, sorry, that would be Maryland, in Maryland, in Severna Park, Maryland, love them. And God loves them. That's amazing. How can you tell somebody that God loves them and help them understand that? Everybody think. Now, when we get outside, I want you to tell your Sunday school teacher one way that you are going to help someone Understand that God loves them, because that's the most important part, I think. All right, so we're going to have a prayer. Oh, wait, I forgot Father's Day. Jamie's with Jesus. We always have dad jokes. So I got two. Why do flags always look tired? Because they're always waving. <laughs> and what do you call a dad that falls through the ice? A popsicle. All right, let's pray. One, two, three. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for sending us and those you send to us so we can understand that you love us. Amen. Okie dokie. Now, parents, we do have computer lab for the elementary, but it's in our new space, 152. Woo! All right, let's go. In my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Please sing with me. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. In my Lord, I want to be like Jesus. 
So I would say again, welcome to the clouds of witnesses. We are in the midst of our stewardship campaign and I'm sure as you saw the tree with the cloud on top of it walking in the front door of the, um, sanct of the church that we are now up to 1,171,321 dollars, leaving us only 370,000 dollars short of the goal of 1,540. As I look out here, it seems that we could probably put that amount together pretty quickly this morning. Those of you that have um, been pledgers in the past, our uh, elders are gonna be calling the folks who haven't quite gotten around to pledging, just reminding you that you need to do that. For the rest of you who have not pledged in the past, you're going to be a recipient this week of my poem to the great unpledged. <laughs> I have a personal goal for us of $2 million, which makes Mark Bowman and Mary Jo Greenlee very happy because we are needing to um, support the many ministries that we have here at Woods and they have been growing and growing over the last couple of months. So um, please be prayerful and thoughtful about that. You can make your pledge by picking up one of the cards next to the tree that is out in the lobby. You can also go online and uh, there is a column for pledge giving. It's important to pledge so that the um, finance ministry knows what to budget for and how much they have to budget. And again, we're gonna go for the $2 million because nothing is impossible here at Woods Church. And um, it's also really significant that we are a great cloud of witnesses together. There is so much that goes on in this congregation in terms of ministry and outreach and help and support. Um, some things you don't even know about that happen here in our community and, and across the state actually. So thank you for all of your prayers and for your giving us um, your resources. And uh, now we will continue our worship. Good morning. Please pray with me in our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. So please listen to the word of God. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my, my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thanks be to God. Before I begin, I uh, just want to thank all of you for being here today, uh, especially on Father's Day. Uh, I want to thank the pastor nominating committee for inviting me to be here. 
And I want to thank Nancy and Sue for literally getting me here uh, as we've gone through the building. So it's wonderful to be here. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 21, beginning with the first verse. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. After these, they went out and got into the boat, but that night they, got, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, he put on some clothes for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What were your dreams for your future when you were growing up? Throughout much of my childhood, mine was to be an astronaut. And I don't just mean in the dress-up sort of way. I mean in a semi-obsessive fascination with everything about both space and the space program. To this day, I can tell you a lot more than you want to know about things like why Redstone rockets were abandoned in favor of Atlas in the Mercury program, why the Apollo Lunar module had four legs instead of three, and why Neil Armstrong's performance in Gemini 8 meant that he was the right person to command Apollo 11. As it turns out, though, knowing those things have equipped me well for local trivia nights and getting out of cocktail party conversations with people I don't want to talk to, <laughs> but not so much for a career as an astronaut. For some reason, NASA feels that mastery of things like astrophysics and calculus are more important, and I've never had much aptitude for either of those things. So my dreams had to be put on the shelf next to the ones about being a major league center fielder who does not run fast and really can't hit a curveball. I think part of the problem is that we often confuse dreams with fantasies. Now to be fair, sometimes we can't tell the difference at first. I thought being an astronaut was a dream, but in reality, it was a fantasy. A fantasy is something that we desire that has very little chance of becoming reality, but it still makes us happy to imagine. A dream, though, is much, much more than that. A dream is a vision for something important, something transformative for us or for our community or for our world, something that can and should happen even if there are many, many obstacles or barriers in the way of realizing it. A dream gives us hope and purpose that helps us persevere in pursuing it when we find ourselves growing weary from trying to overcome those obstacles and barriers. Now, that's exactly where the speaker finds themselves in our Old Testament passage from the book of Isaiah today. The prophet's telling what is known as one of Isaiah's servant songs, four different prophetic poems that center on the plight and purpose of a 
servant who is called and sent by God, who suffers in fulfilling that calling, but who is ultimately vindicated and rewarded by God. In this case, the servant recalls God calling and commissioning them, but the servant's recent history is one of conflict and defeat. I have labored in vain, they lament. I have spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. But they have not lost hope in saying that. They say, surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. Now, Christians have often interpreted the servant songs as prophecies about the coming of Jesus as the Messiah and thus about how the church should live too, since it's the body of Christ on earth now. And that's good and right. Jewish people, however, have generally regarded them as prophecies about ancient Israel, that Israel itself was to be the suffering servant of God in the world. And while the Christian interpretation is valid, it doesn't replace the Jewish one. After all, God does name the servant Israel right here in this passage. Now, the reason that's significant is that at the time of this prophecy, Israel didn't really exist, at least as a political entity. Babylonian Empire sacked Jerusalem in the 6th century BC and carried off most of the economic and political and social elites into Babylon in exile. But this whole section of Isaiah's prophecy is about the restoration of Israel, that those exiles would be allowed to return home and Jerusalem would be restored. It is the dream that every Jewish person has had waking and sleeping since the fall of Jerusalem which at this point was well over 40 years earlier. So as Isaiah is prophesying, whole generations of Jewish people remaining in Judah had never known a time when they were not a conquered people. Whole generations of those who had been taken into exile had never known a time when they knew their homeland. And all of them, every single one of them, has dreamed that perhaps God has not forgotten or abandoned them. Perhaps God, through some kind of miracle, would bring the exiles home. And that shared dream is at the heart of this passage because now it seems like it might really happen. Isaiah portrays the servant waiting eagerly for God's word on the matter, convinced that bringing the people of Israel back together will be that servant's purpose and legacy. But then when the Lord actually speaks, it's not what they dreamed they would hear. It is too light a thing, the Lord says, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. Too light of a thing? Now think about that for a minute. The biggest thing that the servant or the people of Israel could imagine happening the most powerful divine intervention of which they can even conceive is the, really, or the release of the exiles and the restoration of Jerusalem from the iron grip of the Babylonian superpower. And what God is saying here is that if that was all God was up to with this servant, it wouldn't even be worth God's time to do it. It would be too light of a thing to worry about. Because what God is doing is not only that, but so much more. God is giving the servant as a light to the nations. That my salvation, the Lord says, may reach to the end of the earth. That's the point of the servant. That is God's dream for the servant. To carry the light of God's gracious love into the world so it can shine everywhere for everyone. Now, that's the kind of servant that Christ's church is called to be as well, to be a light unto the nations across the earth. But throughout its history, the Christian church has had some problems trying to do that. Sometimes it's confused Christ's light for its own, as if we were the ones generating the light instead of bearing it. But the church can only be the candle, not the light itself. And when some of us get confused about that, the light tends to go out rather quickly. Sometimes the church gets confused about who the light is for. But the point of a candle is not to hold the light for itself. It is to help the light shine out for anyone who needs it, 
who wants it, who's drawn to it. Now, when you get right down to it, that's what it means to share the gospel of Christ in the world, through words or actions or just through our life together. And when the church really understands whose light it is and whom the light is for, that the light of Christ is not ours to claim or keep, but to withhold or bestow, but only to share with anyone who asks for it or comes seeking it. That is when extraordinary things can happen. Those who are lonely find community. Those who are broken find wholeness. Those who are anxious find peace. Those who are in need find support. Those who are despondent find hope. Those who aren't sure what this life is all about find meaning and purpose. That, all of that, is the point of this, all of this, as following Christ as the church, as Christ's disciples in community. That is the dream that God has for us, for Christ's church around the world, and for Woods Memorial Presbyterian Church right here in Severna Park. As I began to learn about Woods and conversations with your pastor nominating committee as well as with church friends in the region, pastors do gossip, believe it or not. One of the things that really got my attention was the way that Woods claims this dream, shares this dream, pursues this dream in your life and ministry together. The commissioning for the Woods work trip in this service is also as I understand it, the 40th anniversary of the partnership with Habitat for Humanity, which is a perfect microcosm for living into that dream of God's. Every year for 40 years except once during the pandemic, a group of youth has come together through this church, though not simply from this church, with a commitment to make a transformative difference in the lives of people by building in just one week one or more houses for them to live in. And in doing so, you not only help a family take a huge leap into making a house into home for themselves, you help them on the way to building that home, a home that they truly own, not just in title and in space, but in heart and in spirit. And in the process, you build a home with one another, a group of young people coming together from different schools, different churches, different faith commitments, different backgrounds and interests and experiences and identities. And in doing so, you create a home with and for each other, a community in which everyone is welcome, everyone has something to contribute, everyone has something to learn, everyone can receive and offer support and sustenance and grace. Now, as I've learned more and more about this congregation, the amazing thing is that's only one part of how you practice that dream of sharing Christ's love in the world. You reach out in community and partnerships to help feed those who are hungry, shelter those who are without adequate housing, care for those who are from another land, support those who are escaping abuse. You've created a whole set of ministries specifically to invite and engage and support people in the life of the church and in exploring their faith called welcome. And in the daily and weekly and yearly rhythms of worship and discipleship and care and fellowship, you are literally incarnating the presence and activity of Jesus as the body of Christ together in this church. In a world where so many churches are spending so much of their time and energy focusing on reclaiming what they used to have, you already know that that has always been too light of a thing for Christ's church. That our calling is always to go out, to be a light unto the nations, so that God's salvation can reach to the ends of the earth. Now the truth is that will always mean something more than we can even imagine doing, much less accomplish in and of ourselves. But that's the nature of dreams to be bigger than we would or even could imagine in the confines of our rational thought, bigger than what seems realistic or even possible. 
And in a world that's mired in stories and experiences of scarcity and smallness and cynicism, that can seem very out of place. Toni Morrison, the late Nobel Prize winning novelist, was once asked by an interviewer about ongoing criticism that the characters in her novels were often too big to be considered realistic when compared to people in real life. That they simply weren't believable in terms of their presence and thoughts and feelings and actions. And Dr. Morrison looked at the interviewer and thought for a moment, and then she replied, the problem is not that my characters are too big. And she leaned in slowly and locked eyes on the interviewer the whole time and said, the problem is that we live our lives too small. Jesus promises and calls us to something much different than that. Much bigger and deeper and richer and bolder. I came that they might have life, he says elsewhere, and have it abundantly. The point, the purpose of this life is not just to be alive, but to live in and out of the abundance of God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. To know that there is so much that we not only can share it abundantly with others, but that in sharing it, it's one of the most powerful ways in which we experience and receive it all the more. Now, I'm grateful for the possibility of serving a congregation that knows that. That is always seeking, quote, to be a church that participates in God's mission for the transformation of creation and humanity. That's what your mission statement says. And that will always be more than we can imagine. And thank God for that. Because it means there will always be something more to live into until God brings God's own dream for all of us to final fruition in eternal life and love and justice and peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next hymn, number 385.
Thank you, Roderick. Please pray with me. All good gifts from, come from you, dear Lord, and from these riches we bring this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your purpose in this community and for the benefit of those in need. Amen. So to, today's offering uh, is to benefit our children's ministry. Y'all can come. And um, that serves children from um, first up through fifth grade. And uh, we ha includes nursery and Sunday school classes, vacation Bible school, and musicals and all kinds of educational offerings. So um, it's a great, it's a great um, use of our resources. And also, just remember, um, you can text Woods at 73256 or go to Give under our Woods uh, website. So thank you so much today.
we have the doxology or? <laughs> we, can, we can do it. Can we I get can, a doxology? We can do it. I get a doxology. <laughs> Please be seated. <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> we are just really excited now for this commissioning, and I will let you start, if you will. Great, yeah. Um, one of my many blessings of my first year of ministry here at Woods was to work tirelessly year-round with the amazing Woods work team. I can't put into words how excited I am for this trip, it being my first time. And I would rant about it, but I think JC put it into words perfectly for me why this trip is so important. So with that said, I want to invite the entire Woods Work 2024 team up here, and we will move forward for you guys. Come up on the stairs for me. And there's a lot of us, so come close. Pretend like you like each other. We can get some rows going here, don't be afraid. Nobody wants to be in the front, so you can come in the front. There we go. All right. This week, you will be moving out of your comfort zone and allowing yourself to see God in expanded ways. This group has committed themselves to travel together to unexpected places, to walk alongside unexpected people, and to witness God's work in the world in unexpected ways. Today, we commission you as a mission team to expect the unexpected. As a congregation, we promise to gratefully receive and actively engage with the expanded vision, the surprising experiences and the new ideas that you all will inevitably bring back to us. We are expecting the unexpected. And as we ask you a series of questions, I encourage you to think about how you are committing yourself to the mission of Christ's work. And with that said, I'm going to join you because I am also going on this trip. <laughs> to all of you going on this trip, do you accept the responsibility of representing the congregation in doing the work of our Lord in Roanoke, Virginia? If so, please say, I do. Will you work to exemplify Christ's teachings by loving one another and by sharing Christ's message with excitement and care? If so, answer, I will. I will. And will you serve in this special work with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, treasuring your experiences as opportunities to teach and to grow? If so, please say, I will. I will. And to the congregation, do you, the members and friends of Woods Memorial Presbyterian Church, accept these people as missionaries chosen to extend our Christian love to others? If so, please say, I do. I do. And will you support them with your prayers, remembering to keep them in your thoughts as they go into the world to share the good news? If so, please say, I will. I will. Let us pray. Guiding and loving God, empower these people to be your hands and feet. Help them to glorify you by serving others. Send them into the world, not just to build houses, to, but, but to build a home for a family. 
by their actions and words, make them witnesses of your great love and your passion. Protect them, teach them, and support them as they take this next step in their own journey to become the people you want them to be. Fill them with the Holy Spirit and enable them to do their tasks faithfully and joyfully. Bring them safely home and allow their experience to further enrich us so that we too will glorify you by serving our community in the love of Christ. Amen. We now commission you to go forward and to do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's all say thanks be to God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Welcome. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Let us come now before God in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for living among us and for the guidance of your spirit in all that we do. Today, we are especially mindful of the blessing of family, both in our homes and in our church, giving thanks for fathers and for those who have been as fathers to us. Our family of faith at Woods surrounds us when we celebrate new places in life, when we grieve losses together and embark upon journeys. We continue to ask for your guidance and good discernment in our decision-making and command companionship as we walk our paths together. And today we are particularly grateful for the presence and preaching of Reverend Austin whose person and message inspire and offer good hope. And we thank you for those individuals who have worked and prayed diligently to bring us to this place. In our world and in this community, we continue to pray for all those who are challenged in their lives by illness and loss by complicated legal and social circumstances and confusing situations. Help us to be ones who help them wherever possible. And we pray for the many impacted in our world by natural disasters and violence and abuse and war and suffering. As we pray for them, we ask that you would enable us to be generous and to be courageous. In our own congregation this morning, we offer prayers for particular individuals, for Marilyn Aperian and David Corbin, for Stacy Hilder and Sarah Robinson and Ken Chantre, Jeff Wood and Donna Barnes, Carolyn Decker and John Hollis, Edie Segree, Carolyn Watkins, Dave Bremer and Earl DeWeese, Louise Jobes and Bob Smith and Linda Weaver, Pete Cooper and Andrea Godwin, Charlie Phelps, Jack Taylor and Joe and Connie Wines. <clears throat> we ask, oh God, that you would be with those who grieve this week with Phyllis Beardmore on the death of her son, Jimmy, with Courtney Szymanski and her family on the death of her mother, Annie Jones, and with Carolyn Watkins on the death of her brother, Victor. We know, O oh God, that we come together in services of witness to the resurrection and thank you for your comforting presence with all those who have been impacted by loss. We give you thanks for the birth of Aria Swift to Perry and Chris Swift. We pray for our mission partners and coworkers here and around the world. And we are particularly grateful for our healthcare workers, for our military personnel and volunteers to first and first responders to crisis. 
And we ask, oh God, that you continue to keep those who are on our prayer list, to hold them, embrace them, and give them comfort and strength. And we pray for Woods Church as we continue to grow and expand in ministry and resources. Let us continue to be guided by our messages of welcoming and diversity and inclusion of all as we go forward as a people of God, transforming lives and society in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to rise for our closing song together. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All move, sit down. <laughs> Except for those who are not active members of Woods Church, um, I ask that the rest of you please stay here. I'm going to do a couple of things now. And um, first of all, I will ask Scott Wiley to come forward. Scott, where are you? Would you please escort the esteemed Reverend Austin to his place? <laughs> Where is Denise?
Okay. You what? Your Zoom or the whole world's Zoom? Just hers. Fine. Okay. All right, uh, welcome to our congregational meeting, which I am now officially calling to order for both those people who are on our Zoom call online, as well as for um, those people gathered here. I'm gonna open us with a word of prayer. Lord God, it is with prayerful confidence in the guidance of your spirit that we come to this meeting. We pray your blessing upon this time while giving thanks for the good work of our pastoral nominating committee and the strong faith of the candidate to respond to them. Let us be faithful in our words and deliberation and joyful in our decisions. Amen. Um, I believe, uh, Sarah, if you want to drag the microphone out here, it's right inside the sacristy. I'm just calling on you because you're sitting. Yeah, I think we need to have that. Um, Denise, do we have a quorum? Okay, if there is no objection, I'm going to ask Denise Hill, who is our clerk of session, um, to act as uh, secretary of this meeting. And she has officially declared that we have a quorum now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I want to let you know that there are three items that we are going to be considering. A recommendation from our PNC to call the Reverend J.C. Austin as Woods head of staff and senior pastor. Secondly, a recommendation to accept the terms of call that includes an equity sharing agreement and Third, a recommendation to authorize certain church officers and members to execute the Baltimore Presbytery Certificate of Call form. And I'm just gonna double check. Uh, Catherine Blacka, where are you? Yay, good, 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 okay, welcome. Okay. Oh, yes. Actually, Sue can take that back too, there we go. All right, good morning, and I hope people on Zoom can hear me. Um, I am Ellen Oaks. I am the, although you just saw me ordained as an elder, I'm going into a second term. So I am the chair of the Human Resources Ministry here at Woods, as well as co-chair of the Pastoral Nominating Committee. Um, I, most of my other Pastoral Nominating Committee members are here as well, so we'll be available to answer your questions. As you came in today, you got a short bio on J.C. Austin, our candidate we're presenting. If you are on Zoom, I put that bio in the chat for you, and I hope you were able to open it. Um, I'm going to just go through some of the things that were in there to highlight some of the uh, process that we went through as a PNC and how we brought Reverend Austin here to Woods. So in the bio I gave you, it included JC's education. He has a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. At, towards the conclusion of his, minister, his time there at Princeton Theological Seminary, he was offered a fellowship that's offered to um, one member of the class, graduating class, and they can choose a place to go and do further study. A lot of people end up going to Scotland to study in the footsteps of our Presbyterian forefathers. But he chose to go to South Africa. It was shortly at the, towards the end of apartheid. Nelson Mandela was president, the first black president of South Africa, and he wanted to explore how the church was handling that transition into a new form of government in South Africa. So he did a year there in South Africa as well. 
Um, prior to seminary, he had a Bachelor of Arts in English, dear to my heart as an English teacher, um, from the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. Work experience, people, uh, we had a lot of complaints as the PNC, why can't we learn any more about this candidate coming? And the reason is that JC is currently the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Bethlehem, and they're not aware that they may be losing their pastor. So we wanted to keep everything under wraps until we had finished our congregational meeting. First Presbyterian, when JC came in, 2017 was undergoing a big break. It was um, shortly after some of the Presbyteries, the uh, Presbyterian Church USA had made decisions that caused some people to feel tension with the church. And so the church had undergone a schism that had caused a large number of the membership to break off to form a new church. So he was called in to rebuild the church and lead them through the discernment and articulation of what would happen there. Um, they had a large piece of property that the two factions were fighting over. Ultimately, the Presbyterian Church USA was able to keep that, and JC was able to work to revitalize that house, or that church, and introduce their first contemporary worship service um, in there very quickly um, and get that up and rolling. Prior to um, his call to First Presbyterian of Bethlehem, JC was working as Vice President for Christian Leadership Formation at Auburn Theological Seminary, which is in New York City. And he was able to work on programs that would allow um, people in that seminary to go out into the community and to um, evangelize into their communities in ways that our presbytery wants to see us as a church do as well, to be able to not just, as he said in the sermon, be a light for those within the sanctuary, but to take that light out into the community. And that was his work um, by and large at the Auburn Theological Seminary. He also established a women's senior leadership program to support uh, women pastors and um, had a, a, few other, um, a few other responsibilities there as well. All of those things I'm putting on the slides are also in the bio that you have there in front of you in case there's um, questions that come up. All right, so before his work at Auburn, um, JC was an associate pastor for evangelism and stewardship in New York City at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church and pastoral assistant for development, stewardship, and evangelism. So he came to us with the sort of background the PNC was looking for. When we started our work in May of 2023 and we envisioned the sort of a background we would like to see. We wanted somebody who had been an associate pastor at a large church and then also had had experience at a head of staff perhaps at a church not quite so large as ours, but had had both those kinds of experience in there. We wanted somebody who had the ability to take the word of God outside of our sanctuary into the community. Um, one of the ways that PNCs begin their work is by looking at that list. Um, I probably should have put this one later, that JC says he feels called to a church that is centered in a rich and dynamic worship life and which uses that center as a base from which to go forth in active ministry. We liked that he said that. It went with the qualities we had looked for in a head of staff here at Woods. When, pres when PNCs begin their work, and when candidates um, put out information on the Presby or the CLC, which is the Church Leadership Connection website that connects pastors seeking a church and churches seeking a pastor, one of the things that they used to do was pastors would select from a list of 33 competencies and PNCs would select from the same list of 33 competencies. The 10 that were most essential to them. Um, shortly after we began our work, they stopped doing that. 
But we still felt it was a fundamental part of what we had looked at. The session was given the list of 33 competencies. Randy had the list of 33 competencies. And the PNC had them. And all together, we selected our competencies. And uh, these are the ones that JC selected because when he, um, prior to coming to Woods Church. And uh, so compassionate was the one that Randy selected at his number one. The ones that are in blue are the ones that our PNC had also selected. The ones that are in bold, which some are, some are blue and bold, were the ones our session had selected. So you can see that there was a lot of overlap between what we selected as our 10 competencies. I mean, you want all 33 when you look at the list really, but we had to select our 10 top ones and there was a lot of overlap between what JC saw as his strengths and what we had selected as the top 10 competencies that if we had to pick out of those 33, okay, we'll settle on these 10, um, there, were a lot, there was a lot of uh, overlap. The PNC was very interested in having somebody who was strong at preaching and worship leading. Spiritual maturity was important to us. Um, JC picked teacher, we hadn't, because you know, you had me, I was, no, no, just kidding. Um, we picked public communicator in there, there were two, communicator and public communicator, between those two, all of us had chosen that. Organizational agility, strategy and vision was something that we had picked and Session had picked as well as being important to Woods Church going into well, we're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century, but I feel like we're just starting it. Um, funds developer, well, Nancy can tell you that's kind of important. Uh, interpersonal engagement, we want somebody who can relate to the members of the church and also relate to the community and bridge builder. The other things that either session or we had picked were willingness to engage in conflict, change agent, collaborator, decision maker, and motivator. Those ones weren't on JC's top 10 list, but we discovered through our discernment process that he did encompass those qualities as well. Oh, let me go through. Let me go through before I go there. Um, the discernment process for us involved listening to literally hundreds of sermons. Before we interviewed a candidate, we had listened to two or three sermons from that candidate. We ended up interviewing 12 candidates um, all together on Zoom. After our first probably eight interviews, was that eight or nine interviews, we um, got a consultant who was the consulting firm was founded by a retired pastor who has lots of connections in the Presbyterian Church. So we hired a consultant. And um, so our following interviews mainly came through that consultant. After we had finished our Zoom interview process, we invited three pastors here for personal visits and in-person interviews. And after that, we sent questions to them, questions for further reflection, which was to see what they thought about those questions, but also to evaluate their written communication style, because we thought it was important for Woods to have a pastor who could not only communicate orally, but could also communi communicate in a written form through things like our Woods Messenger and uh, messages that go out. And once we had gotten all that, the Zoom interviews, the in-person interviews, and the written responses to questions, we sat down with Catherine Blacka, who is our um, comm consultant there and is here today, and we went back to our competencies list, and we kind of evaluated how we did some numerical evaluation of how the various pastors fit with our competencies, because that's where we started, and we wanted to come back to that. And so ultimately, that is how we selected JC to be here this morning. Now, in order to call a pastor, um, I have stood up before you and talked to you about terms of call for Nancy when we've reestablished terms of call. But for a lot of people, this is all very new. If you haven't been on Human Resources, you may not know that there are requirements that we have as a church to meet in order to call a pastor. 
The Baltimore Presbytery has this thing called factors, and factors evaluate the complexity of a position. And Woods Church, head of staff, is the most complex position in the presbytery. And therefore, it has the highest factor in the presbytery. You don't really compare to any other church because of having a relationship with the community center, with the counseling center, with Sunrise, um, and just the size of the church. These things add to the complexity. So once you have your factor, they give you a range of salaries that you may offer to your head of staff. So, the minimum salary for our head of staff position is about 121,000. The midpoint's 151, and the maximum is 181. And so, our salary that we offer has to fall within that range um, when we do that. But there are other pieces that go into the puzzle of a, the terms of call that, as I said, if you haven't been on HR, you may not want to know, but when you're on HR and you're drawing up a budget, you need to know. So these have already been presented to session, and we are asking you to affirm the position of session because the congregation ultimately must approve the terms of call. So this is our recommendation that um, PNC took to session. Salary is made up of cash and housing allowance, and each pastor decides how they want to divide that. So the salary we're recommending is 145,000. Board of Pensions collects 39% of salary for every pastor that a church has as a called pastor. Whether that's an associate pastor or head of staff, it's 39%. So that is always part of our budget. At, in HR when we are drawing up our budget that we have those Board of Pension dues for all of our pastors. We offer continuing education and one half of SICA. SICA may not be familiar to you unless you're self-employed, but I'm sure you know what FICA is because if you've worked, it's been taken out of your salary. So FICA is 7.65% that you pay out of your salary, it goes to Social Security, and your employer pays 7.65%. Pastors are considered self-employed, so they have to pay both of those pieces um, to an estimated payments four times a year. So as a church, we pay one half of that exactly as we pay one half of the FICA for our other employees. So the SICA is that 7.65% of the cash and housing allowance in there. Um, by our terms of our human resources manual, all our pastors and our directors get a discretionary allowance and our pastors get a car allowance for things that they have to do. So when you add all that together, that makes up the terms of call. Um, this terms of call that I'm presenting to you represents a 5% increase from the last time we had terms of call for a called head of staff, which was Susan in 2021. It looks like a 7% increase if you're sitting there with your calculator doing the math, because in 2021, the Board of Pensions was 37% and it is now 39%. So that is, you know, out of our hands. Can't blame Catherine either because she's a volunteer. All right. Um, so. In addition, JC is coming in um, from a church in Bethlehem, PA. And one of the things that we have had to do in our presbytery, we are not the first church to do this, and we will not be the last, is that people are coming in and a lot of times pastors live in manses or things like that. They haven't had an opportunity to build housing equity. And as you know, if you've looked at the housing market, and I have because one of my sons is trying to move back here, it's really skyrocketed. So Woods is offering in the terms of call to provide an equity sharing agreement of up to 160,000 for a primary residence purchase in the greater Severna Park area. How that works is that it's essentially the 20% of what a house would be in our area. And then if it, depending on the price of the house, if it's 20%, let's say that is a round number, Woods has a share in that house of 20%. And at such a time as JC and his family would 
sell the house or pay off the house, um, Woods would get that percentage, including any um, increase in the price. Gee, and the prices are going to keep going up, right? So we get any increase in the price as well, less any selling expenses that would be part of that. Um, Woods also would be providing one month salary prior to the start date of August 27th to pay for additional relocation expenses such as registering cars and setting up other kinds of things that you have to do when you pay. Woods has always paid moving costs. We paid Randy's and we would, um, that was part of our agreement to pay moving costs. JC has a soon-to-be fiancé who will be eligible for sabbatical. She is the pastor of a church in Washington, D.C., and will be eligible. It's a little more than four years. It's closer to five years of service, but they would like to take sabbatical together at that time after their marriage. And so we said that we could say any time after four years um, sabbatical. Normally, it's seven years. J.C. has not... has just about has seven years right now at uh, First Presbyterian of Bethlehem and leaving there, he leaves that sabbatical behind. So Session agreed that we would offer that sabbatical any time after four years. The terms of call also involve a start date, which is August 27th, and that would make his first preaching Sunday, September 1st, a week before our kickoff Sunday. Should I ask for questions before I put up the motion? or? Oh, I'll just put it up. Okay, so I'm going to defer yeah. to Nancy here. <laughs> Thank you. So you have heard uh, quite a bit of information. Let me go ahead and put it into the form of the motion that is being um, presented. And that is that Woods Memorial Presbyterian Church call the Reverend J.C. Austin to be its head of staff and senior pastor with the terms of call presented by the pastor nominating committee to include an equity sharing agreement between the church and Reverend Austin. We will now open the floor for questions. You can use the uh, microphone here and the co-chair of nominating, David Thompson, is here to answer questions as well, correct? Right. All right. Do we have any questions that you would like to ask? Are you asking a question, Lynn, or are you leaving? Yeah. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. Um, can you, do you mind coming forward? I'm sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, uh, Kurt Vineyard. Thank, first of all, thank the uh, committee. Um, I noticed in his salary, and I didn't see any benefits, health care benefits specifically. How is that handled for him? So when we pay the 39% to the presbytery, that covers pastors' health care benefits as well as their pension. So Woods has a health care plan for our non-pastoral staff, but our pastoral staff gets their benefits through the, through the Pre Baltimore Presbytery. Board of Pensions, yeah. Yeah, Board of Pensions. <laughs> How long is the sabbatical after four years? It's three months. Three months, yes. If you recall, for those of you who are here, Susan took her sabbatical and COVID hit. And so hers was divided up into two six-week sabbaticals, which was a session approved. But normally, it's a three-month sabbatical after number of years. Anyone else? I saw a couple hands back there. All right. Have All right. we passed out the uh, ballots? Okay. I'm going to just put up a slide. I'll put this back, but I want to show the people on Zoom. Um, for those of you on Zoom, you are going to be able to vote uh, by sending a private Zoom message so that it stays confidential. If you go to the part um, in the chat, in the chat, hopefully you already opened it to see the information sheet. But there's a little blue box that says you're sending a chat to everyone. And if you click the little carrot next to it, the drop down, you can choose Mark Bullman. And then your votes will go directly to Mark Bullman rather than to everybody who's out there in Zoom land. 
Also, I'm just trying to ask, did you get any questions from people on Zoom? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna put the motion back so that you know what you're voting on. Oops, oops, there we go. <laughs> Don't I get a vote? Go get one. Okay. <laughs> Sue might want to vote too. Would anyone like to provide us with a little music while you're voting, or Sarah? <laughs> Do you? Just letting you know that there will be a basket coming around to take your ballots. So please hold on to them and we'll be passing the basket down to take your ballots. Thank you. Um, make sure that you get those in there. Um, since we're standing here for a moment, does anyone have any dad jokes that you would like to share? There's got to be one or two somewhere. I know we've got comedians. Who's got a dad joke? What? What is it, Marty? I have a joke. Everybody get quiet. Marty is telling a joke. I'd like to tell you a joke about umbrellas, but it would go over your head. (laughs) 
Sarah Ho. I have two things to say. I'm so sorry. One, so I'm Nancy's daughter. If you all call uh, Reverend Austin, you now have two pastors who very, very badly want to go to space. <laughs> and I and have wanted to be astronauts. So if I can have a list of names that I can call when I'm nervous that she's planning to go to space, that would be great. <laughs> but the joke for you, why does Mozart not like chickens? I don't know. Because they keep crying, bock, bock, bock. <laughs> Thanks for that setup, daughter. <laughs> Who else has something? And don't everybody leave because we have another motion for signing up. Yeah, you can't go anywhere yet. Stay where you are. Lock those doors. Bob, this is your job. <laughs> yes? What does JC stand for? It is odd, isn't it? JC, JC coming from Bethlehem. It's kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Jenny. Yes, thank you, PNC. Okay. We have to wait for a second motion. All right, so wait, we need some more stories. There have to be jokes. Denise, you have a joke? Oh. A hippo and a zippo. The difference between a hippo and a zippo? Okay, she's our clerk. It's a good thing. Well, well. Oh, it was the zippo is. Oh, the hippo is heavier and the zippo is lighter. It's a little lighter. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you an English teacher joke then. If there's no dad jokes, like this is my favorite English teacher joke. And it also goes with Nancy because Nancy, you know, loves the animals. So what's the difference between a semicolon and a cat? A semicolon and a cat? A semicolon and a cat. One is a pause at the end of a clause, and the other has claws at the end of its pause. Uh, <laughs> Sarah Hope, how do chickens stay healthy? They exercise. <laughs> all right, you all do better. <laughs> I can't believe. Yes. The farmer's favorite Oriole. Anyone know? A what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're like, they don't have to be dad jokes. They can be anything at this point. <laughs> yes, uh, John. Why did the duck cross the road? It was stapled to the chicken. Oh, dear. Okay, let's keep trying. Sarah Hope, you've got to have another chicken joke. easy, a chicken tender. All right. Oh, good, good. Of course you do. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, what do you call a camel with two humps? Camel with two humps. I don't Pregnant. Know. Pregnant. <laughs> 
We need to have a whole thing. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. What did one snowman say to the other snowman? Do you smell carrots? Oh, gee. <laughs> we are really getting bad here. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, yes. Where does the general keep his armies? In where? Is he sleepy? So, oh, gosh. Okay. Sleeveys. Army. Arm sleeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes, yeah. So maybe we need to tell jokes and then, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, this isn't a joke. I'm sorry. This is serious. Okay. Okay. Come up. Can you come up here? I'm sorry. To the mic. We can't hear you. Vanna White is taking care of this. Thank you. I think this was the, this was the, where is Denise? Or um, Ellen, um, are you, we do, she wants to ask a question about your remaining motions that we've got. We, it, Yeah, yeah, right, I know, yes. No, it's gonna be a show of hands. And uh, so we should have an answer here in a minute. All right. What do you call a really funny chicken? A comedian. I know. <laughs> yes. Come up to the, yeah, that's good. Two men went into a diner. Why did one order chicken and one order eggs? Two men went in a dire, diner, one ordered chickens and one ordered eggs. Why is that? They wanted to see what came first. Oh, <laughs> bad, yeah, that was pretty good, actually. <laughs> Thank you, that was good. <laughs> Oh, good, Andrew. A cow with no legs. Oh, is that right? Oh dear. It's on the ground. It's not necessarily. All right. Okay. Well, why don't we just shift gears then? Um, pastoral care. Anybody got any pastoral care concerns that we need to know about? We can pray for. Uh, where's our Stephen minister? I know we've got a couple of them here. Um, do we have pastoral care concerns? We've got three funerals coming up this week, um, so we'll be asking you to be prayerful about that. Um, and we have a wedding. Nancy Nolan's wedding is coming up. That's very exciting. Yes. All right, Nancy. Oh, that's right. Jim Hyatt is going to be there, isn't he? Yeah, Jim will be there. <laughs> John Strand, yes. Yes. We're ready to. Are we ready? Oh, thanks be to God. Okay. <laughs> do I announce the total votes? Do you want me to announce Go ahead. The total you do votes? it. Yes. Total? Yes and no. Um, yes. Okay. Um, the motion, the first motion has passed by a total of 245 yes votes and nine no votes. Okay. All right, so this means that we do know how. <laughs> and okay, we now, go ahead. I'm trying to move my screen and it, oops. Okay, there we go. Um, Oops, extra motion. All right, so our second motion is that the moderator, which is uh, Denise, and secretary of the congregational meeting sign the certificate of call along with members of the pastoral nominating committee. So a vote is by a show of hands. I'll turn it to Nancy there. Yes. 
Okay. So all in favor of this motion, um, please raise your hands. I think that does it. Any opposed? All right, the motion carries then. We are now going to um, bring the new head of staff and senior pastor at Woods into our midst in just a moment as soon as we get in there. Um, we uh, also want to figure out how we want to welcome him back in. Are you going to stand and clap? Are you going to tell jokes? Are you going to sing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I do have one thing I want to ask you before we do that. Um, because JC is currently the head of staff at Bethlehem Pres First Press of Bethlehem, and he has not yet told his session and um, his congregation, because obviously he had to wait till after the vote. So we are asking for your continued confidentiality in this age of um, rapid information until Wednesday so he has opportunity to inform his current church and they don't hear about it. There are, we did find as we did um, a lot of reference checks on our various con candidates um, and we spent extensive time on the phone with our references, I guess I should have said that before, um, that there were a lot of ties and we found references who had been here to Woods to help with weddings and uh, had other um, lots of cross wires throughout the presbytery. So we would ask you to just hold this as a con piece of confidentiality until JC has that opportunity to inform uh, First Press. Um, I will have a second motion, but we are going to welcome our new head of staff. Absolutely. If you'll just stand here with me for a second, yeah. yeah. All right, you may be seated, and uh, JC is going to speak to you in just a second. I have a second um, motion that I need to uh, put before you concerning the signing of a certificate of call with members of uh, the nominating committee and Catherine Blacka. So I need to make that motion that we will be uh, having that signing happen. All in favor, please raise your hands. Any opposed? You can now talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is a joy to, to be here today. Uh, it has been a joyous process coming through this and getting to know the PNC. I have been eager to be with you all and to get to spend time with you. I'm looking forward to getting to know you more and more as we do this. I know you've been in this room for a long time at this point, so I'm not gonna belabor things, but I just wanna express my profound gratitude at this call, my joy in accepting it and my eagerness to be here uh, with you all, you all before too long uh, happens. I'll be spending the next few weeks, you know, saying goodbye in Bethlehem and wrapping up things there. I'll be coming here um, at the, you know, toward the, in, towards the end of August and looking forward to, uh, to jumping in with both feet and uh, finding out uh, what the fall and what the future has in mind for us. But uh, I'm very grateful for this call. Uh, I felt the spirit powerfully moving through this and it's wonderful to have that confirmation instead of saying, no, actually you got that all wrong, and, uh, it, but, uh, but it's great to be here. I'd ask for your prayers for the people in Bethlehem uh, that for going through this transition as well. Um, it's a joy for me to be coming here. It's gonna be hard to be leaving there and, and for them to go through that. You know what it's like to go through a transition. And so if you will um, hold them in your prayers during this time, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, am I doing benedicting are. or are we doing I, anything else I after do that? Want, we do. Well, we, we actually both want to thank the um, PNC for yes. all the work that was done and the amazing stuff. <laughs> and they stay standing during the charge and blessing so you can... Take it away. So this is the charge and blessing that I often offer, and it's one that's special to me, and hopefully it will resonate with you. But it goes, go forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, 
Render to no one evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. Support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. And now we go to the reception. Right. We'll walk Go out. in peace to the reception. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks for all your help this morning.